pronouncing it properly, please forgive me. Uh, she's she just currently. Thank you. The she's currently the registrar of Shattered Institute of Personnel Management, which is uh, I'm sure very close to Nekade in Ikeja. She's also a fellow of that institute, and she holds a master's degree in human resource management. Uh, Uluwatoni has a comprehensive and strategic understanding of human capital management, leadership management, development, workforce planning, performance management, change management, learning and development, employee relations, diversity, equality, and inclusion, DEI. Uh, our diverse experience in human resources management spans over 30 years period as a senior HR executive and consultant across industry sectors in the UK and Nigeria. Uh, she attended the London South Bank University 2005, where she obtained a master's degree in human resource management, University of West London, 1999. And then, of course, our own university. And I'm proud to say that I also graduated from Ogun State University, where I read law and political science. She read bachelor's degree in English. Like I said, she's a chartered, she's a chartered, uh, she's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management, and she's currently the registrar of that institute. Madam, you are most welcome to this uh, gathering, and I trust that you'll be willing to share your perspective with us on the current situation and the paper that Mr. Oyedele will present today. The other gentleman that I'd like to present to us. Uh, this morning, in addition to the very rich profile of others that I have done, is Mr. Adebayo Olumuiwa. Mr. Adebayo Olumuiwa uh, is a distinguished figure in the world of finance. He brings to the table a profound depth of knowledge in fin diverse finance domains, including financial reporting risk management, taxation, and international financial standards. His academic achievements include a higher national diploma in business administration and management from the prestigious Yaba College of Technology, a bachelor's degree with honors in Acura Science from the University of Lagos, an MBA from University of Cumbria, UK, and a postgraduate diploma in transfer pricing from Middlesex University, UK. He also holds a graduate program in a, a graduate program in data science and business analytics from the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, having spent several years honing his skills in the banking sector, Adebayo focused primarily on internal financial controls functions, including risk management. He, had, he transferred to Deloitte IFRS advisory in Nigeria as a senior IFRS specialist expert and also a research fellow. His pivotal contributions to the team led to regulatory carve-outs on tax implications and leverages for corporates for the FIRS, which is Federal Inland Revenue Services, between 2011 and 2012, during Nigeria's transition to the IFRS reporting standard. Mr. Debayo's educational pedigree is unquestionable, featuring noteworthy alumnus status from globally recognized institutions such as Harvard Kennedy School of Government, Columbia Business School of Business School, George Business School, Cambridge, Macomb's Business School of Business and University of Texas. Uh, as a respected educator, Adebayo shares his expertise through various financial and reports, accounting tutorials and professional exam programs affiliated to ICANN, ACCA, CIMA, and CFA Institutes. In essence, Adebayo is a seasoned and accomplished finance professional well versed in an area of finance domains such as structured finance, project finance, mergers and acquisitions, data science, financial modeling, business analytics, and a host of others. Mr. Debayo, it's my greatest pleasure to welcome you to this gathering, as I trust that you'll also be willing to share your perspectives with us. We've taken 22 minutes of the time for introduction and opening remarks. I think it's a good time to go straight into the business of the day. On that note, it's my pleasure once again to welcome to our midst and to request that he presents his paper, Mr. Taiwo Oyedele, Associate Professor, Babcock University, Elisha Remo. You are most welcome, sir.
Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you to NECA for inviting me. And thank you, Mr. Modrito, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, I only have 30 minutes and I have a lot to go through, so I'll get straight into it. So the topic that has been assigned to me is looking at government policy trust and then focusing on how do you manage the socioeconomic consequences for businesses, for workers, for households, and for the country uh, at large. So this is pretty much looking at everything, but then um, just an overview, because you would agree with me, if we have the whole day, we'll still not be able to finish this topic. It's quite broad and very important and germane um, to our country at this time. So my profile is here. So this is the outline of uh, what I want to go through in, in the short time that I have, I uh, want to start with the socioeconomic context for our country so that we understand why things are moving the way they're moving, why government is trying to do what they're doing, why various interest groups um, have various demands that they are making. Uh, so because sometimes you may not agree with them, but you need to understand where everyone is coming from. We then have an overview of government policy trust. And then we uh, zoom in on recent key changes and implications for various stakeholders. And then I'll, I'll share my final thoughts. Now, the socioeconomic context, um, you know, and what I've done is for each of the sections I have for this presentation, I have just one slide. Um, so just follow me. So if you look at the table to the right of the screen, this is the breakdown of the multidimensional poverty index that was released last year by the Bureau of Statistics. Before this data was released, uh, Nigeria used the income approach. The income approach to poverty uh, simply looks at whether you're able to generate uh, or earn about $2.15, uh, it used to be $1.90 uh, per person. So which means you're expected to have a certain level of income. And then we'd assume that your life is not too miserable because you can earn that amount of, of living. Uh, by doing that, we were around 8 million, the World Bank projected that we probably have reached about 95 million people who are living in, uh, in poverty, below the poverty line. Now, this latest method of calculating poverty, which I actually prefer, is not looking at whether you have the income. It's looking at whether you have access to the things that make life meaningful at the very basic level. So like access to education, health, your living standards, things as basic as safe drinking water. Is the water you have reliable? Can you live in a clean environment, sanitation? housing material, do you have a home where the roof is not made of natural items or the wall and the, and the, and the floor, right? So if the floor, the wall, or the roof is natural, then you are likely living in poverty, like mud houses, yeah, cooking fuel, assets. And these are not big assets. We are talking about radio, farm, fridge, right? And then unemployment, underemployment, and insecurity. Just look at that. By focusing on whether we have access to the things that make life meaningful, more people, far more people are living in poverty. And that's what we call the multidimensional poverty. Now, why is that important? That is important because Nigeria as a country is at a level where this should be the absolute priority of government at all levels, whether it's local government, whether it's state government, whether it's federal government. You cannot be thinking about going to space. You should not be thinking about Nigerian air. You should not be thinking about refinery that you're turning around without results when you can provide safe drinking water for your people, when they cannot have access to basic uh, health care, when they do not have a roof over their head. Because the problem you create by that is that you have social problems. Uh, because you have a country where the average population age, the age of the population is around 19, one of the youngest in the world. So if these people don't see hope 
and they don't have what to rely on, then they take on to all manner of vice. If you look to the left of the screen, um, I've just tried to summarize the socioeconomic issues we're dealing with. Uh, economic growth is very slow, right? Um, in fact, the average growth for Nigeria over the past 10 years is under 2%. Average GDP growth rate in the past decade is under 2%, a period when the growth rate in population is around 3%. So we have continuously become poorer every day than the previous. And then government has low revenue receipts and then even worse, low forex receipts, which is why Naira has been volatile, uh, which is why Naira has been depreciating, which is why government has been borrowing. When they could not borrow, they printed the money to spend and that complicated our economic situation. We have incoherent policies, which is beginning to change now and it feels like a, a, a breath of fresh air. Uh, up to now, we had incoherent policies, uh, both in terms of within the federal government, right, as well as with subnational, vertically with subnational. Uh, you know, local government pulling in a different direction from states, and state pulling in a different direction from federal government. And individually, those levels of government have agencies and organs also pulling in different direction. And then we're surprised that we're not getting the result that we want. It's impossible. It's not by prayer, it's not by fasting, fasting, it's not by hoping, it's by doing the right thing. It's a natural law for any economy to grow. Certain things must be in place, including some policies that are consistently applied and clearly communicated. We have rising inflation and unemployment rates. Our unemployment rate has not been updated for about three years now. So we like to still believe it's 33%, but we all know that it is much higher than 33% now. Um, inflation as of last month, 22.4%, likely to rise further because of subsidy removal, as well as FX unification, impending uh, you know, removal of subsidy on, on electricity. Uh, and if but it's instructive to note that Nigeria, while the issues that Nigeria is dealing with are not very peculiar to the country to a large extent, the rest of the world on the average seem to have managed their affairs much better, such that as of today, our inflation rate is more than twice the global average. Uh, we have growing poverty. I've already mentioned that. Uh, persistent budget deficit, not only at the federal government level, but even at the state level. I know most time we focus on federal government. If you look at the budget of the state combined, it's about 10 trillion naira, and their revenue is under 5 trillion. So they're just as worse, uh, as bad as the federal government and combined, it's not a good picture for our country in terms of the direction in which we want to go. We also have, you know, wasteful subsidies now being addressed and you have significant government inefficiencies. Uh, you find a governor that is going for a meeting in Abuja and they'll hire a private jet when they could easily take business class uh, and spend maybe 5% of the money, right? You have convoys when they could be just two or three, you have 10, you have 15. Uh, you have people, you know, we put up projects of, of uh, 100 million naira, and then they spend half that, that amount to commission it, invite all manners of people, pay for their flights, accommodate them in hotels, you know, call entertainers. It's just the wrong priority. So you have states building airports when they don't have roads from farm to market and they don't have primary school, no basic health care for their people. Government revenue is extremely low and that's leading to high public debt, uh, which has continued to grow. As of last year, 2022, we spent 96% of our revenue at the federal government level to service our debts, uh, especially, uh, you know, including ways and means. Uh, and there's also the domestic arrears that we don't calculate. So Nigeria is actually owing more than is being reported, right? Even when you add ways and means, when you add contingencies, and then think about the mess, just, just ask everybody that government is owing today to raise up their hands and tell you how much government is owing them. They've delivered. So I have companies that have delivered multi-billionaire projects that government has certified as delivered according to plan, but they haven't been paid. That's a debt, right? 
So if you put all of that together, uh, Nigeria's debt is, is completely out of tune uh, with our economic fundamentals. Uh, we have declining investment, uh, foreign portfolio, portfolio investment dried up uh, very quickly, uh, even before COVID, uh, and then further complicated by government policy uh, incoherence and also the rising interest rates in developed markets. Uh, so FDI, foreign direct investment, which is really the one you want, the patient's capital, has also dried up. Last year, we got under $500 million as a whole country for a whole year. I can't wrap my head around this because I keep saying that this is the amount of capital you attract for one project in Nigeria, not for the whole country for a whole year. Even beyond that, domestic capital formation is dwindling. So even the investors that are within the country are not investing. And then we have this unrelenting wave of emigration that our people are leaving, even though the numbers of people that have left relative to the population of Nigeria is, is very small, but you are losing top talent. So it's significant to that extent. Uh, that top companies that are on this call can attest to what I'm saying now. It's difficult now to find the right talent that you want almost across the board. Uh, whether it's technology, we have banks that are struggling with their IT infrastructure because all the guys left. Um, and the same thing with whether you're looking at people skills, whether you're looking at project management, whether you're looking at, you know, everywhere. Those of us in consultancy, uh, you know, I would like to believe that we're the top, you know, in, in this, in this uh, immigration. The, the other part of that story is that this wave of immigration is not limited to individuals. It's also uh, spreading to corporate. I know that's not the word we normally use for corporate, but businesses are exiting the country. Uh, some are just closing down. We've, we've heard about, you know, game before then it was, was ShopRite. Recently we heard about Unilever closing some of their iconic brands. And not to mention about so many other companies uh, that are closing down factories. One of the things I do that people don't so much know about is that, uh, you know, I'm an insolvency practitioner. So part of my duty is I liquidate companies. And I can tell you the number of companies I've liquidated in the past two years have more than I've done in my entire career. Of course, these are not companies that are listed by everybody in the body are companies, right? Even if they have only 10 employees, uh, it means that the economy has not been moving in the right direction. Uh, on top of that, we then have um, uh, geopolitics and the political economy, both locally and internationally, uh, affecting us, not least is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as some activities going on in the international community around the tax base, particularly led by the OECD. We also have regional factors like EFCFTA, the ECOWAS Treaty and Protocols, which are influencing a number of things on the ground, including import duties. Many of you may be familiar with the 2023 fiscal policy measures. Some of the changes introduced in that document were driven by the ECOWAS treaty uh, that we have to comply with, right? So all of these put together uh, means that we are in a situation that is really difficult and there are no easy solutions. So there is no solution you're gonna administer that is gonna be easy. Uh, you have to then look beyond short-term, into medium to long and say, since, if you do nothing, we will suffer. If you do something, we will suffer. How about we find what is that solution that will make our pain to be short term, be minimal as much as possible so that medium to long term, we can all uh, you know, celebrate and be proud of our country. Look at the bottom of this slide to the left, and you see the trend in federal government budget. Uh, the, the black bubbles, uh, you know, represents, uh, you know, government debt service, uh, the cost of debt service. And then the one in the middle uh, is government revenue. And the one on the top is expenditure. Just imagine these very three important indicators are moving in the wrong directions. Revenue is not moving up quickly as much. And it seems like there's a race by the debt service cost to cash up with revenue and then Expenditure is just running away completely uh, out of tune with the other indicators. So that is the picture of where we are. Now, what is the government's policy trust? And I'm focusing on the new government, the government that is less than one month old, right? 
Uh, as someone says, we have done in just three weeks what we haven't done in a decade. So it's a lot uh, to take in at once. But let's say the starting point is to try and remind ourselves about the manifesto of the current president, Ahmed Tinubu. So the key focus of that manifesto, I know that we lost confidence in manifestos because sometimes the candidate don't even know the content of the manifesto, let alone implementing them when they get into power. But this seems to be a different uh, you know, precedent in that regard. He promised first subsidy removal, public private partnership, revenue generation, industrialization, investment in human capital, infrastructure and public spending to stimulate economic growth, and then student loan regime. So I've just highlighted, and this was something I put together before this government was sworn in, right? So I read through the manifesto and I said, these are some of the most important promises. And in three weeks or four weeks, almost half of that list has already been delivered. In fact, in my view, uh, the most difficult of those, uh, of those decisions. So, but let's break it down a little bit more. So in addition to that manifesto, uh, the signaling of where this government is going to go and the direction in which the policies uh, will seek to take us were articulated very clearly in the inauguration speech and then followed up subsequently by policy actions. So essentially, this president and this government wants to run a market-driven private sector-focused economy. So in other words, don't distort the market, allow the market forces to work and don't have unfriendly investment policies that will discourage investors and businesses from setting up and from expanding. And that principle, I don't think anybody would disagree with it. Although you have a handful of people or maybe not handful, maybe more than that, who would disagree with the approach. Now, what have we seen? We have seen first subsidy removal, essentially full deregulation of the downstream sector, because before now, we did not have subsidy on diesel. We removed it over a decade ago. No subsidy on, on kerosene, that's household kerosene. No, 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 no subsidy on the aviation turbine kerosene. Uh, the only thing that has subsidy was petrol, and it was so difficult to remove it, but now it has been done. Uh, of course, not with the pain and the consequences that we're having to deal with. This will also pave the way for us to fully implement the Petroleum Industry Act. We have the foreign exchange unification, and people describe this differently depending on who you are speaking to and from where they're coming from. Some say that it was the depreciation of the Naira. Uh, some say it was an appreciation of the Naira. Uh, I would say it was a removal of, you know, forest subsidy. Uh, I think this was a removal of subsidy. Uh, you know, one, one guy said that, you know, the rates in the old IRE window by the government was family and friend rates. So because nobody even knew what you needed to do to be eligible to assess that rate, you know. So it was really just subsidizing the wrong people and making some people corrupt and allowing for round tripping uh, that does not help the system. So we have removed concessionary rates, whether it's for going for pilgrimage, whether it's for buying FS for school fees, for medical tourism, uh, whether it's for government taxes and levies, whether it's for sharing of FARC revenue, whatever it is, those rates are gone. But of course, the rates will not be perfectly unified. I don't know any country where they just have a single rate. So the target is not to have a single rate. The target is to have an anchor rate. Uh, and the other rates will hover around it in a way that the difference is not material enough to create economic distortion. That's really want to, where you want to get to, right? So in many countries, you know, I'm out of the country now. I'm sure if I call the hotel and I say, what's your exchange rate? The exchange rate in the hotel is different from if I go to the mall, like just maybe four minutes away, right? So, but then that difference is not enough for anybody to distort the market forces. So that's okay. So where we want to get, because some people are looking for the exact rate to be in the parallel market, in the ah, new window, to be everywhere. No, it's never going to happen. So this is more like harmonizing it and allowing willing buyer, willing seller to drive 
uh, you know, the rate. The president promised to tackle multiplicity of taxes. We haven't seen a lot yet in terms of policy actions, but this was very clearly communicated in the inauguration speech. And for someone like me who deals with tax matters every day, speaking to a large, small, informal sector, former sector, everyone, I know what this means. This is killing businesses by the hour, literally. Uh, and I can't wait for government to put in real structures that would address the problem and do so in a sustainable manner because, uh, you know, government after government have paid lip service to this problem. And in fact, they left the office that they occupied, making it worse than it was when they got into power or into those positions. I can tell you just in the last uh, National Assembly alone, at least four to five new taxes were introduced that were not there. But if you speak to every single member of that National Assembly, they thought there was multiplicity of taxes. If you spoke to the president and the minister of finance, they would not blink before telling you multiple taxes is killing business. Yes, they're doing exactly the same problem and making it even worse. So this president has promised that there will be a turnaround in this space. And I can't wait to see that happen. Not only do we have multiplicity of taxes, we have all manner of earmark taxes. If the roads are not good, you say, let's introduce road tax. If you need education, you say education tax. If you want information technology, you say, let's introduce NITLA levy. If you are thinking about engineering and science, you say NASENI. No, no country has been able to run the economy successfully on the back of earmark taxes, right? I think it's like what Winston Churchill said. It's like you know, standing inside a bucket and hoping to lift your head, hand, uh, your, yourself up by the hand. It's impossible. You can't tax your way into prosperity if you haven't created the environment for there to be prosperity. The president said he wants a low interest rate regime uh, that will spur investment. And I do agree with the president, even though this is a very difficult balance to strike when you have inflation that is rising and you're having this uh, you know, policy around first subsidy removal, exchange rates, unification, all of them putting upward pressure on inflation and by extension, uh, you know, rising interest rate, not lower interest rate. But I do think that if we address the fundamentals of the economy, we can get our interest rate to a single digit as well as our you know, inflation rate to a single digit. It does look like, as I'm saying it, it just feels like a dream, right? When inflation rate in Nigeria will be single digit and interest rate will be single digit, that would be fantastic. And I think it's, it's achievable over the next two to three years. It will not be immediate. Uh, financial system cleanup. Uh, the president wants to clean up the central bank and the financial system more broadly, including monetary policy and fiscal policy environment. Um, the, the, what the, what this government wants to do is to try and separate different functions of the central bank. And I like to put them into three buckets. So the current central bank as we have it today is doing monetary policy, is doing financial services or banking supervision, and it's also doing development finance, right? So the same CBN will come out and tell us monetary policy. This is what uh, interest rates will be. This is what we're doing with FX with Naira stability and all of that, right? And then they wake up again and say, well, we are supervising banks, they have not complied. Let them go and build the um, national theater. They've not really built the national theater. They say, hey, by the way, can you... We've almost confused banking for something else, asking them to do a manner of things that banks you know, don't normally do, uh, just because we regulate them and they are afraid. Uh, that you may take away their license. We, we were ordering banks around stamp duties, even against the judgment of the Federal High Court and the Court of Appeal. It's in, unbelievable, complete impunity. Uh, and banks cannot go against the CBN, and CBN is disobeying the court order. Going into the foray of fiscal policy, right? You do RT200, you do export this, you do all of that, and then development finance. You're doing SME, you do pharma, you do all manner of things, almost right, like running a parallel government. That's not the way central banks are run around the world if they are to be effective and efficient. So this government is looking at, can we break up those functions so that you just have a central bank that focuses on monetary policy? Maybe you have another organ that focuses on financial 
services regulation and then you can take the development finance function to the different organs of government some of them should be under ministry of trade some of them ministry of finance some of them under development bank of nigeria and so on and so forth so these five areas from an economic point of view are the biggest and most impactful policy direction of this current government and we're just watching it unfold and we're hoping that that temple will not only be sustained, it will be done in a way that is robust and benefits the country. Now, uh, let me quickly, I, I can see now I only have about five minutes left. Now, what are the recent key changes and what are the implications? Now, this is like the most important uh, slide that I have for our conversation today. <clears throat> I will not go through everything. Uh, you will have a copy of this presentation. What I've done uh, based on uh, the instruction that, that NECA gave me, was to look at this policy trust and how it affects businesses, workers, household, and the nation. And I thought, let me just do a table where I can put the challenges for each of these stakeholder groups. What are the opportunities and what should they be doing about it, right? So take businesses, for example. There will be rise in the cost of power generation, especially SMEs that do I better pass my neighbor to power their small business just to cut hair, you know, to do vulcanizer work. Those guys buy petrol, their costs will go up. They're also entitled to, to be considered, to be catered for. Someone needs to think about them. Even large businesses are not, uh, they are not insulated. They have vehicles, a fleet of vehicles running on petrol. Uh, their staff will have to pay more for transportation and therefore ask the employers to increase their pay. Uh, we have rising inflation, falling margin, because you can't pass all the costs to your consumers because, remember, their own purchasing power is declining. And that, what that means is your margins will skew such that the profits you have to report, if you have any, will be less. And some companies will even move from profit to loss making. Um, import duties and taxes. Before now, if you want to pay import duties, there was a special rate for import duties. Now you have to use the higher new window rate for import duties. And that means you pay higher in narrow terms. And some taxes have to be paid in foreign currency, including VAT, withholding tax on anything that you pay in foreign currency. The tax must also be paid in foreign currency. And uh, now you have to pay those taxes at uh, the equivalent of, of the iron uh, window uh, should you want to buy the dollars. But there are opportunities. <clears throat> Demand for local substitute would increase because import is more expensive. We expect there should be forest liquidity in the medium to long run, and there should be an, a low interest rate regime uh, that will stop crowding out the private sector because government would even need to borrow less because their revenue is going up significantly. Um, taxes will be harmonized, so also is the revenue collection agencies, and our exports will become more competitive because in terms of the cost, we have cheaper exports abroad and that can help us under the AFCFTA to service the African market and the rest of the globe. What action plan should businesses take? Plan your cash flow. Uh, make sure you plan everything. Now don't do anything without proper planning. Project your capital, uh, cash flow, capital costs, recurrent costs, fixed costs. Think about what costs you can cut. Um, you know, maybe even encouraging staff to work from home can reduce your you know, utility costs and also save those staff the cost of transportation. Ensure tax compliance. This government is not smiling about tax matters. So you don't want to be on the wrong side of tax penalty and interest. And then think about hedging your FX risk to the extent possible and where you can, if you have FX asset, preserve them. For workers, there'll be high cost of living, low purchasing power, the risk of black taxes. What that means is if you still have a job, the number of people depending on you is increasing now. And the amount of demand they have on you has gone up, right? Because they are struggling to survive. So the person you used to give 10,000 Naira before, 10,000 Naira is not enough for them anymore. Maybe you need to now make it 12 or 15. Meanwhile, your own cost is going up. And there's more pressure for some people who can afford it to leave the country. They say, maybe you should just leave, right? Um, on the positive side, there'll be more employment opportunities uh, in terms of there's a very, very desperate search for talent. I can tell you that from where I sit. If I see talent now, you can almost tell me what you want, right? Uh, and this talent is not people applying, you know? so you are looking for five people, 
10,000 would apply. That's not a problem. But by the time you narrow it down, you'll be lucky to find two out of the five. Uh, so not only would there be employment opportunities, there'll be very good career opportunity. Because just imagine all those very juicy positions that people left and relocated abroad. We, then we need to replace those roles. Uh, flexi work, some employers are more open now to flexi work conversation than before. There's focus on keeping your talent, which is good for those talents. And then possibility of uh, minimum weight adjustments uh, in the public sector, but also some private sector. We heard about, you know, GT Bank doubling their, their you know, entry level uh, pay. And what action should workers take? Focus on productivity. Don't just keep thinking how much more can your employer pay. Your employer needs to survive because if they go down, you go down with them, right? How can you be more productive so that whatever they pay you is less than the uh, value you add? Uh, and then explore other income sources. Think about what you can do over the weekend. For some people, it's farming. For some people, it's trading. For some people, it's something online that you can do on social media. Take up another skills. Do something to bring some income to augment and complement your salary. For households, high inflation will mean high mystery index. Uh, you're spending more on energy, on transport, on rent, and food. Uh, there's high cost of foreign study for those who can afford to send people abroad. Uh, as well as medical tourism, travels, whether it's PT or BT now, the, the amount has gone up. And card payments, some of us have card payments, you know, the association you pay on a monthly basis, those payments have gone up, not in dollar terms, but in Naira terms. And this can lead to higher inequality because when you have rising inflation and you have subsidy remover, uh, it tends to affect low income earners more than high income earners because they are, tend to have more assets. So middle class and upper class will have assets. So they are protected to a large extent against inflation, whereas the low income earners are not protected and therefore inequality in society can, can widen. Uh, in terms of the uh, upside, uh, fuel products will be more available. We don't expect there should be scarcity of fuel products uh, going forward. And standard of living should get better as government is able to channel the savings into human capital investments, critical infrastructure, and so on and so forth. What do you need to do as household? You need to change your lifestyle and think about how to even uh, optimize the little that you have. For example, uh, you should not be living in, in uh, Aja and your church is in Ikorodu and then you drive like 40 kilometers just to go and watch. There's blood everywhere, right? And same thing for the schools of your kids. You are not trying to impress anyone. Find a good school that is close to where you live. Don't tra travel 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers to drop them uh, at school. Um, and even when you are driving your vehicle, there was an advisory that mom and, uh, you know, put out. And I thought it was very instructive. Don't put any loads in your boot if you don't need to. Think about ride sharing, use public transport, even work, trek. If it's just about one or two kilometers, just trek. It's good for your health and it's good for your pocket as well. Then the nation, let me wrap up quickly. Nigeria uh, is likely going to lose its number one position as the largest economy in Africa because just take our GDP of about 210 trillion naira, convert it to USD now using this uh, going rate. You will see that Nigeria is now below both South Africa and even most likely below Egypt. Um, at the last time before this was done, Nigeria was at $440 billion. Um, South Africa was uh, $404 billion. Uh, but I think this is not something to worry about. We will bounce back bigger and better, so nothing to worry about. Per capita income would also fall. Uh, so that would easily mean that Nigeria may not be uh, lower middle income anymore. We may uh, be downgraded to low income uh, you know, per capita country. Government debt would increase in Naira terms because you just need to convert the dollar amounts at the ruling rate, and then the amount goes up significantly. And then the cost of uh, administering palliatives, if we are not careful, like what labor is asking for. Uh, if you do half of that, you'll be spending more than the amount you are saving uh, in subsidy removal. On the positive side, uh, we're going to have a you know, high revenue uh, from, from tax resources, from tax, from resource, that's uh, crude oil, and then from forex. I calculated the savings from forex alone, uh, and it was about 4.5 trillion um, in a year. Not even, not even just, uh, you know, the subsidy remover, right? Um, the NMDPRA, uh, that's the, you know, midstream, downstream regulator said that 
the consumption of petrol has reduced by 20 million liters per day. Just imagine that. I just calculated the savings on 20 million liters per day, and it's over $7.5 billion we are saving in forex and over 4 trillion naira in, in naira income to government. That's just forex. We didn't even calculate that before, uh, before you now take other considerations. Lower budget deficit means that you borrow less and you stop crowding out the private sector. Our sovereign credit rating will get better because the major reason why they downgraded us was we're spending all our money to service debt. Uh, no funding for development before. Now we can have funding for development. And by taxing, you know, by removing subsidy, not taxing, by removing subsidy on fair products, we are making progress towards net zero because people will then migrate more towards solar energy, other renewables, reduce their consumption of fossil fuel. What should government do? Government must ensure there is complementarity uh, in policies. Don't do one policy from monetary side that is solving a problem and on the fiscal side, you are compounding that problem like 43 items that are prohibited from accessing FX in the official market. That doesn't help. It doesn't help unification of rates. Border closure, you can't produce enough rice and then you ban rice importation and they smuggle it in. It doesn't help because one, it still put pressure on your FX. They're not using error to pay for those, uh, you know, those importation. And government is not getting the import duties. Plus it's even annoying that there are taxes you have to pay in dollars. And there are levies you have to pay in dollars, NIMASA, MPA, in a country where we are trying to promote, the Naira do not create demand against your own currency. It doesn't make sense. Uh, then effective communication of government policy is very, very important. So in closing, what should we do? And what is my final thought? Just to remind us that we need very important changes to happen and they'll come with some pains and that's what we're going through. I do share the view of the DG of NECA that those pains will be short-term pains, especially for businesses and poor households. But there will be benefit for all, whether it is government, whether it's household, whether it's businesses, whether it's anyone, we all benefit in the long run, medium to long run. And then um, there's a bit of overreaction. You know, people will say, because my fuel cost has gone up by 200%, then the transport fare will go up by 200%. I say, what kind of math is that? You know, you would imagine that um, the right hailing people, uh, you know, Uber and the other, they said they've not increased their, you know, their thing enough. I say, it's because those guys are using data to calculate the increase. And they've realized the increase is about 15 to 20%. But, but the yellow cab is just increasing everything times two. The person that is selling, uh, you know, pepper is also increasing by times two. I think those things will adjust themselves and there's also a bit of exploitation in that. Intervention must be evidence-based to be targeted, to be inclusive, and to address the most impacted vulnerable population. Not everybody I'll be impacted. I don't need any subsidy for government. So uh, there should be sunset clauses. Don't go and, you know, remove one subsidy and create another one that is not sustainable. Think about the cost benefit analysis. I don't believe in buying buses for, for labor. For example, it's not sustainable. It does not address the problem. It reaches less than 1% of people that will be impacted. Avoid fraud prone intervention. Don't share money. Once you get $800 million and you start sharing it, it's fraud. Uh, less than 10% of, of it will get to the people that need it. Consider tax relief and don't introduce new taxes or higher tax rates. For example, there shouldn't be this VAT on diesel. It's, the timing is wrong and it's insensitive for government to want to do that. Don't put excise duty on manufactured products. It is the wrong time to do that. So there are things we must do and there are things we mustn't do to make this process not uh, you know, unnecessarily painful and unbearable for the people. There should be effective change management including clear communication and a feedback, me feedback mechanism. Government should not do a, a one-way communication uh, like a radio announcement, right? Even radios today, you can feedback. You know, hear from the people, listen to them, and factor this into what you're doing. There must be effective stakeholder management. Nobody should be left behind. And government regulators must have regulations and guidelines. Uh, CBN should not be issuing like, you know, 15 seculars in one week. Yeah, think carefully about what you want to say, engage people and say it in a robust manner, not that you say it and you forgot two things and then you bring up another one. Those things 
uh, don't build confidence in the system. And government must lead by example. If you're asking us to make sacrifices, what sacrifices are you making? How are you cutting down the cost of governance? Uh, I know that that's not the money that will balance the budget, but it's, it's symbolic and it's important. And to close, Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So thank you very much for paying attention to me. I'm sorry that I spent an extra you know, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uye, Taiwo Uyedele. It's been a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. By way of personal observation, one area which I probably would want to pick your mind about is how to, at the expiration of the tenure of this government, how do you protect the policies that have been put in place so that we don't have a reversal? Because that's one area where I have my concern. I don't think in Nigeria we have, the, we believe in the principle that government is a going concern. But let me leave my thought for now. Let me bring in the discussions of your presentation. And I'd like to start with, having started with a man, let me go straight to a woman. I'd like to start with the registrar of the CIPM, Oluwatunye Naewo, to please, first of all, get us to understand her own mind in five minutes, what she thinks, and then she can then also bring in the perspective of the paper of Mr. Taiwo Oyedele. Madam Toyin, please register CIPM. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, actually, we're in the afternoon now. Good afternoon, um, everyone present on this session. Mr. Oyedele, thank you so much um, for your presentation, very thought-provoking as well. Um, thank you, Neka, um, DG. Thank you, opportunity. Thank you to my fellow, um, to the moderator. Wow. Um, I think I will start with um, some figures that really threw me um, when I sort of asked what was currently happening in Nigeria in terms of our social economic policies and the government policies trust. And looking at the inflation rates, which currently stands at 22, it's quite high on a year on year basis. And this is our third, we're just in June, 2023, halfway through the year or nearly halfway through the year. And we're already on the third increase in inflationary rates. That says a lot about the current state of the economy of Nigeria. Another area actually that speaks very, very quickly to what we're talking about today is our current debt level, which stands at 77.77 trillion or dear. That is high. It says a lot again, back to our economy, back to any government policies um, that are gonna be generated, have been generated or promulgated in the last um, couple of should I say weeks or four weeks that the new government um, was There's a lot to be done. As a nation, we cannot continue to accumulate debt and accept that and expect that we're gonna get out of the current situation that we're in. The more we pile up in terms of our debt levels, the more the nation is in a lot of problems. Not even going yet into the paper that um, Mr. Oyedele actually presented. And the third one, because this speaks very quite clearly to our role in CIPM as the regulator of HR um, profession in Nigeria, is our unemployment rate, which currently stands at, well, at the forecast is 40.6% unemployment rate in Nigeria. Again, that is also a concern. I might seem or sound very negative. I thought throwing out these figures will get everyone on this call thinking about the topic under discussion, thinking about what are the consequences 
um, in terms of the business, in terms of the household, and in terms of the nation. Um, as we're going through this, I would really like to talk about this and begin to bring that to bear on either how we formulate our questions or what we intend to take back to our respective um, businesses. Or actually, if you're in government, how I'm sure we have government representatives on this session as well, um, how we take this back and um, the discussion back to our various workplaces and how we begin to come up with policies that are actually implementable, I would say, and they're actually realistic. I think in HR, we always the fact that um, when we set targets and we set objectives, they must be smart. Um, so that's a summary of my thinking generally. It covers more or less everything that um, is an overview more or less of the paper that's already been presented. Um, because for me, picking up on what um, Mr. Tyro said, we had a discussion surrounding the social economic factors. Um, we had a discussion surrounding analyzing the social economy, um, the current social economy. And for me, I agree um, with um, what has been presented. Another particular area, actually, and I'm going to keep doing this because, again, that's where um, the strength of CIPM lies. Looking at everything that's been presented today and thinking of consequences, a lot of it has to do with our workers. A lot of it has to do with the plan of the new least one president of the in terms of the capacity of human capital and increasing that. A lot of how we're going to get ourselves out of where we are as a nation also goes back. In all that we've said, and in all that is currently being discussed, what is the government, what will be the government plan in terms of the current workforce? Whether we're talking about the workforce, mainly actually the public sector, because the public sector is the largest employer of labor in Nigeria. What are we doing in regards to the companies that are existing? That there's been a lot of reforms. Um, a government will come in, they will bring in the particular project and a reform, let's reform the workforce, um, let's ensure that they're fit for purpose, let's look at the work structure. That is all well and good. Has there been an assessment of the impact of all these reforms we've had in the past in terms of the workforce? Has there been an assessment and how have those actually impacted positively on driving some of those issues that we discuss surrounding our social, the social um, situation in the country. It is important that we actually begin to think about that, whether in our various businesses, in, even as government representatives, we begin to think about our workforce. Without a competent what you work, use? Like products. Without a competent Without a competent workforce, you cannot begin to actually have the kind of nation that we desire. The workforce drives a lot of what happens. They are your asset type. Our human resource components in any business, in any, they drive everything that happens. The way we treat them, the way we motivate them, the border says a lot and would actually impact on their commitment whether you're talking about um, extrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation as well. So I think that's another area that we have to also um, think about. Again, I come back to the government policies. Now, looking at the areas that we discussed, we look at the removal of the fuel subsidy, the unification of the forex exchange. Um, there's news all over the place, again, surrounding increase of proposed increase in electricity tariff, um, lifting of restrictions on um, domiciliary accounts and a whole lot of other policies. I'm coming back again, the impact again on our workforce, business, removal of first subsidy. I mean, come on. We've had discussions around this, even at the Institute surrounding how is this impacting the workforce? A lot of people will say it's more expensive to get to work. I actually like what um, 
Mr. Tyro said. He said something about if the consul has gone up to 500, 488 per liter, does that mean that you have double the cost of transportation? But in reality, that is what people are facing. That is what our workers are facing. So let's begin to think about it. What are we going to alleviate some of these temporary measures, temporary issues that um, the workers are currently going through? If I come in as an employee and I've spent maybe half of my salary or wages on transportation, it gives me less um, fluid in terms of my other commitments that I may have. What are we looking at in terms of how we begin to alleviate that? Um, again, these are these, I've heard a lot surrounding working from home, flexible working policies, and how do we show that that is implemented to alleviate some of this? At the same time, I'm also going to say that you also have to bear in mind the kind and the nature of business that you're in. It's not that can afford for individuals to work from home, factory setting, for instance. Someone has got to operate machines. So again, that's another area. Not all businesses can afford to have people um, working from home. If you cannot afford to have people working from home, then what are you going to do to support the workers and help them? A happy workforce will be the one that would actually help you achieve um, your business goals, um, your targets for the year. Um, so I think, again, another area, that's another area that we look into. Um, another area that actually um, caught my attention surrounding the issue of the current loss of our critical talents to countries outside Nigeria. I'm thinking again, back to the workforce. That is quite a huge um, drain on our resources. I share with you your pain um, as a team um, firm, um, PwC, I've heard uh, and we've heard a lot going on in different organizations um, as an institute, we have our members um, in various organizations across the public and private sectors of the economy that are talking about how this is impacting on their ability to even deliver a service. That is another area. Why are people leaving? I mean, of course, we know why. Some of it has been actually shared with us. The cost of education is high. To get a good education in Nigeria is high. People want better lives for their children. Income levels are not as high or cannot match up to the current inflation. Um, we both, I mean, Mr. Tyro also mentioned about the fact of living conditions. If I think I'm going to have a better living condition outside of Nigeria, wouldn't I access those opportunities rather than remain in Nigeria? But at the same time, it's doing quite a lot of damage, I would say, to the nation and to our economy. We're losing our doctors, our healthcare workers, the medical field. We're losing our auditors, our accountants, a lot of roles that are quite pivotal to running, you know, to actually getting us out of what I would call a rut at the moment. It's not permanent, and I agree with you, um, DG, I agree with you, um, moderator, that it's going to only be temporary. But in that temporary moment that we're currently operating, what lasting impact, and I'm talking now negatively, would it leave on us as a nation? And I think that's another area that we need to do. Um, Mr. Moderator, am I out of time? Um, so I can allow other um, discussants to talk, or may I continue? Just, okay, okay. 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 I, I, you are very much out of time. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so maybe you pause for now so that other moderators, I mean, other discussants can also present their position. And then when it comes to question and answer session, we can then further expand on the position. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Registrar CIPN. Uh, the, the, the picture we have is not.
he's not smiling as they put it on the street. He's not smiling at all. Uh, exit of uh, talents, implications for our health, implications for the accountants, for the auditors, and several professionals that uh, litter the workspace. But that's where we have found ourselves. One other area where I am very concerned about is, look, some people brought us to this point, and I think this is one area that discussants can also look at. Some people brought us to this point. What is the, is there no, is there no consequence for these actions? Are there no consequences for these actions? Uh, on that note, I'd like to bring in Dr. Ogo Okiti to share his mind with us, please. Continue to list out your questions. We are harvesting them uh, so that uh, at the end of the day, we can throw them back at the discussants. It's becoming very, very animated and very, very exciting. Uh, Dr. Kitty, once again, I'd like to thank you for coming. The last time we spoke, uh, it was very, very educating. Uh, now we have two prophets in the house. Mr. Yudili has agreed with the DG that is going to be in short term. Let's see what Dr. Kitty will say. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Kitty, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you so very much, uh, Body, and uh, I am very, very delighted uh, to be here uh, with, uh, this afternoon. Uh, there is echo. There is echo. I don't know if uh, I don't think it's from my side. Um, okay, so I think it's better now. So anyway, uh, so thank you so very much uh, for inviting me again. Um, uh, before I make my comments, let me first of all uh, commend um, Taiwo Oyedele for that most impressive presentation. I mean, um, I think uh, I'm. I think he's probably the only one that could have simplified uh, the our situation uh, the way he did. Um, uh, I'm not sure there's any other person that could have been able to. Uh, combine macro, micro, and of course, uh, socioeconomic issues in just very, very few slides and explain them the way he did. So thank you so very much, um, uh, Taiwo, uh, for that. Uh, so I'm just going to make uh, three comments. Uh, I think the first one is to kind of complement what Taiwo already said in the time in relation to the motivations for these uh, policies. I mean, these policies have been crying to be to be done, I mean, for ages. But we have uh, a new government and within the space of two, three weeks, um, it has been, I mean, the new president has been able to do that. But it's also very, very important that we just don't know what is done. We also understand the motivations. The reason why it's important to mo understand motivations is that you can predict the pattern of what is going to come. So I see two motivations. One is that, as um, Taiwo said, this government is going to be market friendly. So all the distortions in subsidy, distortions in foreign exchange, and all the kind of distortions that we have seen and that rent seeking that people are just making the country. Uh, so the first motivation is, can we have a market determined rate or market determined prices for some of the major uh, transactions in this country? That's the first motivation. The second motivation, obviously, is to build a fiscal, um, uh, to build a strong fiscal position. Uh, because when you are subsidizing, you are creating discussions, obviously there are some people, uh, the debt is piling up, the deficit is piling up. So you have two motivations, one, a market, and of course the second one is to bring a strong, to build a strong fiscal position. So people have asked me, which one is stronger? I think the first one is actually stronger and it will be very, very easy for you to start to predict this government. In terms of um, the market and the strong fiscal position, whenever there is a conflict, my thinking, and I reckon that President Bola Hamed you know, will choose to go with the market rather than build a strong fiscal position whenever they are in conflict. But so far, we have not seen any reform that is in conflict with those two motivations. So that's the number one point. The second point I want to make is that I don't know whether it's a profit. I don't think it's a profit. I think it's because we don't know what is happening. It's definitely going to be a first, I mean, a difficult two years, at least. I mean, that is, I think that is certain. It's going to be a very, very difficult two years. And the reason is very, very simple. 
So if you actually come back in the last 10 years, we have three shocks. Uh, so we have the high price decline shock of 2024, 2016, sorry, 2014, 2016. We have the COVID shock of 2020. We have the Russia Ukraine shock, which is not actually supposed to be a negative shock, but in the end, it turned out to be a negative shock. That's the third one. Let me now add to this. This fourth one is the fourth shock. The removal of web subsidy is a shock to the system. So how does shock work? Shock walks through the entire price system. And my thinking is if you consider three layers of this shock, you're going to have the one we are seeing now is mostly the transport logistic shock uh, to the price. Uh, sorry, to the price of transport and logistics. That's number one. Then after that, the second layer is to the food, the food price system. And of course, the third one will be the salary and the wage adjustment, which will come. If you actually consider these three layers of shock, my expectation is that they will walk through the system for about 18 months to two years before we begin to have some sort of equilibrium if there is no any other shock. So that's the second point I think I want to make. However, the other point to make is this. If we say we are, it's going to be a difficult two years, does that mean that after two years, it's just going to be, we are just going to be flexing? Hmm, not so fast. There are some conditions to hit. And let me just try and mention about three or four. So we are going through this reform. It is the best reforms that we have seen since 2007. That is great. However, the attraction of investments, especially foreign direct investment, and even the attraction of some sort of foreign exchange receipts will not come except we do the following. One, what are the opportunities that we are creating for investment? So it is not sufficient for us to just say, okay, oh, I liberalized the foreign exchange system. Oh, foreign exchange is now determined by the market. However, you must now go out of your way to create the opportunities for foreign investment. And it must be conscious, it must be deliberate, and it must be intentional. So that's number one. Number two, how does the government now deal with budget and deficit? So it is very, very easy to collect billions and billions and billions and billions from Nigeria in place of the subsidy that was being given before. But if you collect those billions of Naira uh, from Nigerians now, because like this morning, I bought for 510 per liter. So if you collect all those Naira, what do you do with them? Do you use them to reduce the debt? Do you use them to reduce the deficit? Do you, risk, do you use them for investment? Those are good ones. But what if you just use them to have more convoy, to have more girlfriends, to have more, which is also possible in government? So if all we have done is taking subsidy away, and now we are subsidizing extravagant lifestyle in government, then we will not get those investments. And of course, we will not have a net positive of these reforms. That's number two. Number three. It's also tied to number one and two. This is the time for government to build savings. If you actually go and look at the reforms of 2003 to 2007, the most important consequence of those reforms is that the government was, Obasanjo government, was able to build savings, considerable savings. And it is when people see that your foreign reserves is healthy, your foreign reserve is significant, that is when they feel comfortable to bring their own dollars. Nobody brings dollar into a country where they are not even sure of capital preservation. And foreign reserves is one of the insurance for foreign direct investment. That's number three. And of course, number four, also tied to the previous three. What happens to inflation? What happens to price stability? It is very, very important that we have price stability. And the only way you can have price stability is, of course, by providing opportunities for investment, by dealing with budget deficit and debt, and of course, by building up savings in your resources. So we have done the reforms. However, there are other things. Reforms is not sufficient. You now need to do the hard work, the hard work of making sure that we improve the business environment. That's number two. So let me now talk to number three, and I will stop. So many people have asked me, do I agree with the way that President um, Bola Hamed, you know, will remove subsidy. Yes and no, because I think we have been on it for 50 years. I don't think there was any point debating or having a meeting to remove the subsidy. So he removed it the best way that I feel he could have done it. Fine. However, 
since that subsidy was removed, since exchange rate, I have not seen or heard of any single government communication. That is a problem. Communication is very, very critical. And it's not just because I'm in a communication industry. So in the Nigerians at the moment, they have a short fuse. They don't understand these sacrifices they have been asked to make. They don't understand it. They only know that they are asked, they have been asked to make sacrifices. And because it's a new government, they are willing to give a benefit of the doubt. However, if I was going to have Vice President Bola Hamed tomorrow, I would say, you need to communicate with Nigerians. You need to talk to Nigerians. You need to give details about what is happening, about the savings that is not happening, about what the resources will be used for. It is not sufficient to just increase salaries. You need to communicate to businesses. And those communication needs to happen very, very fast before some people start to miscommunicate and in the process raises anxiety and, of course, worsen social economic contracts and conditions in Nigeria. Those are my few points. Thank you very much. I hope the moderator is not on mute. Buddy? Can anyone reach out to Buddy? Perhaps we can ask the next. Um, okay, who is the next? Yeah. Yeah. the next speaker can hear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for Tawik Dillon's presentation, and likewise the first and second discussions on this matter. And uh, I think I will start from this uh, uh, this question. Uh, the question is very simple: How free is a free market system? And um, Within the free market system, what role does subsidy equally play? Uh, whether subsidy technically is to be removed in totality or subsidy should be redirected towards rejuvenating the economy and also addressing the social effect of it. Now, um, let's start from this perspective. Uh, Hello? Let them unmute, Mr. Fadi. Okay, I can continue. Now, let's start from the issue of policy please, integration. Can we have introduction, please? Who is speaking? Let's have introduction. Okay, uh, this is Olumu Adubayo, the chairman of the Committee of Finance Experts, MECA. Okay, now uh, let's start with the policy integration. Uh, there are about three to four policies that uh, more or less drive economy within advanced and developing nations. And I think we'll talk about monetary policy first, we'll talk about fiscal policy next, we'll talk about trade and investment policy thereafter. And the question then is, uh, how do we expect to integrate this policy towards ensuring the rejuvenation of the Nigerian economy? And as it was said by most of the speakers, you'll find out that uh, in this administration, it is probably essential for us to ensure that uh, the policies are more or less integrated in the sense that uh, the objective of the government should be driven by the coherence in all of those policies, which means uh, monetary policy must speak a uh, language that probably might aid fiscal policy objectives. 
vis-a-vis -vis trade policies. Now, uh, today we talk about free market system, but again, within that free market system, we expect government to equally play a role through its laws and regulations. And such roles will be, how do we protect consumers? How do we protect the middle classes and most especially the vulnerable the poor? How do we prevent monopolies? And how do we maintain market competitiveness? Especially in today's global world, who do we compete with? We compete mostly with international businesses. And that's why you find out that uh, we need to create an environment that will make our local production cheaper to more or less uh, consume rather than importation cheaper than our production. And this speaks to the volume of issue of having infrastructures, having incentives, and having those climate enabling environment that allows productivity within the Nigerian space. Now, in addition to that, Let's speak about cost of governance. Uh, even though um, the presenter more or less focused on cost of governance towards the tail end, I believe cost of governance, if it is being addressed, is going okay, to okay, it's okay now. It's going to uh, assist mostly uh, people, the citizens, and uh, the people at large to really support the government of today with respect to its policies and changes towards the free market system. And this speaks to the fact that uh, let's start from our budgeting system. Uh, today, we we'll focus on our budgeting system by looking at the capital expenditure, recurrent expenditure, and probably aspect of recurrent expenditure that goes to servicing of debt. Now, but again, uh, we need to also look at it that a small fraction we have with our capital expenditure, you still find out that we need to delimit our capital expenditure into productive capital expenditure and uh, more or less administrative capital expenditure. What do I mean? For example, we even say capital expenditure ranges between 30 and 40% of our budget. But when you more or less review all of those capital expenditure, you see that most of them goes into administrative expenditure, such as buying computers, kitchenettes, item, motor vehicles, and the rest. What that means that I believe the new budget administration needs to separate the heads of capital expenditure that are much more into production, infrastructure, away from capital expenditure that is more or less to enhance administrative activities within the government or public sector. Now, also, when we speak about trying to liberalize or probably unify, the exchange rate. Again, one thing that I could also pick up from what uh, Taiwo said is the issue of trying to still restrict some items, about 41 to 43 items. And the question then is that this can equally create issues within the parallel market, whereby what we tend to converge may not naturally converge itself. And most especially today, no matter how robust all of these policies are, one thing that is key is that one thing is to have a good policy framework, one thing is to be able to implement it effectively. And one of the ways of implementing it is from the fiscal aspect and this border on taxation. When we look at our tax system, it requires extensive reform. Okay, which reform am I talking about? Reform whereby we need to integrate our taxes. Today we have over 60 or more taxes across in which companies suffer by way of federal taxes, state taxes, and local government taxes. And the question then is, if you look at it based on statistics, no more than five or six, uh, six of these taxes account for about 90 or more percent of our global taxes in terms of government tax revenue. We then speak to the fact that why can't we simplify our tax system in such a way that it encourages economic production it encourages investment, both local investment and foreign investment. And let us speak to the fact that we have the Joint Tax Board. I believe that government can more or less set a machinery in place whereby states should more or less streamline their taxes, not more than two or three. And equally, federal government should streamline their taxes away from over 12 to about three or four, and likewise local government, such so that the efficiency, cost of collection, the administration of it, and the ease of doing business will be achieved at the same time. And I think that is also critical in what we need to do. 
And I appreciate that this government is much more private sector oriented. But again, one thing is to say that, and another thing is to action it. And the action is what we expect at this point in time. Another aspect of it is the issue of uh, extensive stakeholders' engagement. Uh, gone are those days, in the last eight years, we find out that uh, even in the process of developing finance bills, which becomes an act, we find out that really do we have extensive stakeholders' engagement where it's a two way communication. And it means that. Uh, to have economic prosperity, to have a private sector driven economy, the organized private sector vis-a-vis -vis other players within the economy must be able to sit down with government of the day to offer more or less solutions, even though it's not done that government take all of those advices. But the question is that there is more or less an engagement that people believe they belong to the policy framework of the government. Another aspect of it, which we need to talk about is issue of um, trying to build our human capacity. Okay, uh, I did an analysis of recent and I threw up the question within a professional setting, whereby I discovered from the uh, data provided that we have about 127,000 Nigerian students in the UK alone. And we're not talking of those in Canada or in the US. And uh, if you look at it, the average cost, without considering other incidental costs, which is the average tuition cost in the UK, if you convert it to Naira, is about 10 million Naira. And therefore, multiplying 10 million Naira by 127,000 gives us simply 1.2 trillion Naira educational spending by Nigerians, which if you check it probably by today's rate, it can go as much as $1.7 billion. And the question that speaks to the fact that how can government with participation with private sector more or less rejuvenate our educational system? Okay, yes, we can give applause to government for introducing a uh, student loan, but again, we need to address the fact that uh, what is contained therein does not necessarily reflect the reality of today. And the question then is, if we can be able to rejuvenate our educational system, we build not only capacity, we export capacity, we bring in investments within that sector, and that can also protect our local industry vis-a-vis -vis demand for foreign currency. Imagine 1.2 trillion going out of the economy on a yearly basis, whereas the government budget is about 20 trillion and the revenue is about 10 trillion. And the question then is, what can we do in order to reinvent the wheel in order to create economic prosperity? Another thing that I more or less look at is the aspect of Sorry, Mr. Moderator, um, Mr. Muiwa is joining back. He had a, a system freeze. Yes, he, he can come He's back. joining back immediately. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, sorry. I think the network uh, switched off. Okay, now, again, we're talking about the aspect of taxes. Now, rather than government taxing the little business within the tax net to prosperity, why can't government create a enabling environment so that we can more or less earn more economic activity that no matter the little amount of taxes you charge, government is able to equally generate extensive revenue. All of these are things we need to bring to the table at the end of the day. How do government provide policies that will allow not just productivity, 
but also consume most part of what we produce in order to reduce our balance of payment deficit, which will have extensive uh, negative impact on our Naira or our foreign reserve. All of these are things I think government need to put in place. Um, uh, in summary, therefore, we believe that uh, the current administration is enjoying the goodwill based on the fact that one, is private sector friendly from, its, uh, from what we know by trajectory. And also, secondly, on the fact that this government has started on a good note. But again, most importantly, we need to have framework. We need to have execution plans that is well communicated and well transparent enough in order to continuously enjoy the support. And based on what people project, Yes, two to three years is expected to be a period of uh, nurturing the new policies, the new objective of this government towards economic prosperity. But again, the action this government is going to put in place between now and the next two years will tell us much more whether there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Olumoyiwa Adebayo. That was a wonderful analysis of, uh, or a, a wonderful expression of your mind concerning the paper of Mr. Yedele and the current situation. And yeah, if it's going to be, if it's going to take about two, three years before we start seeing the gains of this administration. Then what happens after that? Uh, Anyway, let me let me. Some questions have come in. Uh, I'd like to go back to uh, the register of uh, CIPM. A question has been thrown. Uh, moderator, uh, Mr. Moderator. Yes, please. There's a discussion that you have left out. Oh, my name is Muda Yusuf. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please come in. Please come in with your position. My sincere apology. As a matter of fact, I did not even introduce you properly, but I'm sure you. Please share with me your profile, and then at the appropriate time, I can then make a proper introduction. But for now, please go well, ahead with your position. Yeah, let's just go ahead. Let's save time. Uh, well, let me just, uh, I mean, practically all the things I would have said has been said by all the speakers. Excellent uh, presentation by Mr. Taiwo Yedele and the other, other panelists. Just to complement what they have said very quickly. One, I think we need to understand that reforms are not ends in, the, in themselves. They are means to an end. And the end is the welfare and well-being of the people. So it is very important that as quickly as possible, we connect these reforms to the welfare of the people. And people need to see results they test within the next two, three months. Because the pain that this, this reforms has inflicted, particularly the fuel subsidy thing, we cannot underestimate it. The pains are enormous. We have seen some of our citizens trekking. Some trek the full length of their journey. Some trek halfway to get to their place of work. Many of them cannot even go to work again because the economics of even going to work has had has collapsed completely because of the transport, particularly in the cities. So we need to connect this to the welfare of the people and as quickly as possible. And we also need to you know, caution the government against the right messaging. The messaging must be very right. Now, how do we explain a situation? You have this kind of pain that people are complaining about. People have shown amazing understanding. Labor has shown amazing understanding. And the next thing we are hearing is that electricity tariff is going to go up, that uh, this zoo is now going to attract 7.5% VAT, that tuition fees in tertiary institutions are likely to go up, that custom duties is, is going up. I mean, this is not, there's a limit to what the citizens can absorb. So the social context of policy it's extremely important. And that is also the theme of this discussion, the social aspect of it. Because if you don't have social stability, nothing else will work. 
the citizens begin to kick against some of these things, even all the laudable things that we hope to achieve, we may not be able to achieve them. So it is very important that the government realizes this. As we are undertaking these reforms, the relief needs to follow immediately. And there are some quick wins that you can quickly deploy so that we can entrench, deepen the legitimacy of the administration. And of course, a lot of these things, apart from this uh, uh, you know, increasing wages and all of that, that is not bad. But what percentage of the population are on the payroll of either the government or even the private sector? You know, very, very small percentage. So we need to do something that is economy-wide, something that impacts everybody and address the core issues of the cost of living, cost of transportation, cost of food, cost of medication, cost of education, those things are very critical. And going to specifics very quickly, I like to see a reduction in import duty on mass transit buses. Any buses above that has 15 passenger capacity and above, let us slash the import duty by 50%. For companies that are producing these buses locally, let us give them SKD zero duty so that they can bring in their raw materials, SKD, couple it, and make more buses available. And we should remove all charges and taxes on all things that has to do with energy. If you are importing PMS, if you are importing diesel, let us remove all the charges so that at this time we can at least reduce the temperature and reduce the social tension. That is very important as a transitional phase. After one year, we can begin to return to imposing of some of these charges. And some of these charges, as uh, Taiwo said, some of them are even in dollars. So let us waive all of that while we ride through this, in, this uh, transitional phase. Then this is not the time to be imposing excise duty. Taiwo also said that, and I'm sure the DG also said that. We should prevail on government. The recently announced excise duty, which President Buhari gave us a parting uh, gift. We have let, let's roll it back because excise duty is, is a import is, is, is a tax on production. Those who are in production are grilling under a lot of pains now. This is not the time to be introducing additional tax on them. So let us roll this back, you know. Then let us look engage with the manufacturers. Let us look at their intermediate products. If there are products that we are not producing locally and the import duties are high, let us reduce the import duty for manufacturers, for those who are in food processing and all of that. And those who are in agro, agro processing, let us also reduce their import duty. Now we have so many rice mills all over the place, they don't have rice paddy. The Lagos State rice mill alone can probably feed the whole country, but there is no paddy. Because paddy is under import prohibition. So rather than allow all this smuggling to come in, we can have an arrangement with the rice millers. Let's liberalize the import of uh, rice paddy. That is the paddy that they can now possess on their mills. If you have a meeting with the rice millers, you can come up with a, 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 a solution that will not necessarily affect those who are rice farmers. Because under the last administration, there was so much issue about these rice farmers. I'm not saying we should not grow rice locally, but if you have limitation in terms of capacity, let us complement with some input so that the price of food can come down. The same thing with all these things you use for bread and so that we can address the issue of food. That is very important. Then for vehicles, I only learned now that because of the, the, the recent uh, issue in terms of customs duty, cost of vehicles are going up. Why can't we just look at that? Now you have an import duty of almost 40% for you to get a vehicle on the road. And yes, you will have an economy where almost 90% of your movement transportation is by road. That is not reflecting the reality. You don't have a rail system, you don't have a mass transit system, and you are imposing so much tax on, on vehicles. So why not reduce that? Right now it's about 40%. We can bring down bring it down to around 25%, at least for vehicles that are 2,000 2, cc engine and below, so that the middle class 
all these young guys who want to go into Uber and all of that, they can have access to it. I think that is, is very important. Then we need to look at uh, things like all the equipment and machineries that, uh, that, that, that uh, manufacturers need, the equipment and machineries that those who are in the health services also need. The import duty on some of these health services uh, providers, some of the import duty can be as high as 30%. Why can't we reduce that so that access to health can be much easier? And the tax we impose on private investors in health and education needs to reduce drastically because these people are investing their private funds in building the human capital of the country. They are filling the gaps that the government cannot fill. We are talking about people who are jackpot and all of that, but we can build more capacity by investing in education, by investing in health. The government cannot do everything. For, for. So for the private sector people that are investing in this space, let's roll out generous incentives, tax incentives, in, incentives on uh, their medical equipment and all of that, so that they can contribute much better into, 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 in, into this space. So some of these things are very important, and some of these things are actually quick wins that you can deal with. I'm talking about electricity. We are talking about renewable, we are talking about uh, net zero and all of that. We should scrap anything in poor duty on renewable energy equipment, solar panels, solar batteries, and all of that. We can afford to do that. Just as Tywo said, from this reform alone, we are going to make a series of almost 10 trillion naira. So there is room for us to give away a lot in terms of import duty, in terms of taxes, at least to push in the effect of all these uh, all these reforms across board, not just about those who are, who are earning salaries. Then anybody earning less than 200,000, 200,000 and below gross income, let us give them zero tax in terms of PE. Let us exempt them from taxes. We should also roll out some tax incentives for SMEs. I know that right now we have a threshold of maybe 25 million uh, uh, naira turnover where well, we waive income tax, I mean, company tax and so on. Let us increase that threshold. We can afford to increase it to around 50 million in the light of what is happening so that you uh, give more breathing space to small businesses. You know, I mean, so I mean these are some of the things. I, I, sorry, I know I've taken a lot of time, but I'm just looking at this very quick wins that the government needs to roll out. That is what the people want to hear from government at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And by way of a personal comment, I, I think the DG, the DG NECA has been doing a lot in terms of radio engagement, but I think, in the, I mean, given all of the submissions today, we need to even do more. Uh, I understand Mr. Taiwo Yedele uh, will be leaving by 1 p.m. and that, that's just about uh, three, five, five minutes time. Maybe you should just give us his closing thoughts on some of the issues that have been raised. I don't want to uh, take any specific question for now. Uh, maybe he could just, I'm sure he has been listening. Maybe, could he, maybe he could just give us his closing thoughts so that we can allow him to get into other engagement. Mr. Yedele, please. Yeah, thank you very much. A very uh, interesting conversation and the points of view from the panelists uh, have really enriched the, the conversation. I think the issues that have been raised are very germane and relevant. Uh, one is around policy coordination. Uh, so not only do you need the policies to be complementary, they also need to be well coordinated. And not only at the federal level alone, but across uh, different tiers of government. I think one indication, early indication that we have seen with this, uh, with President Tinubu is, even though there's no cabinet, but you already see there's a special advisor on coordination of policies, right? So that gives you a signal as to the direction in which the government wants to go. And I, the other one I want to quickly address is, uh, you know, this, you know, how long should we wait for the benefit to start coming in? The pain is here already. And the pain is not getting getting easier. One, I agree with uh, Dr. Muda Yusu. You shouldn't you shouldn't come across as insensitive. It's not the time to start. You just suddenly remember that you never collected VAT on this. You suddenly remember that uh, import duties uh, has to go up. You suddenly remember excise. 
you suddenly remember, you know, tariff, uh, you know, adjustment on electricity. It, it can it can drop everything on people at the same time. The fact that they have been understanding does not mean that you should take them for granted, right? So part of leadership is emotional intelligence and empathy. Empathy means that whatever is within your control, you hold back on that so that you don't heat up the system unduly. Uh, that's one. In terms of when should we start getting the result, I do think that there are some of the benefits that we should start getting immediately. As soon as they share fact, uh, so the fact they are sharing now is that of May, so nothing has really changed. By the time they are sharing the fact for June, I would expect that all the state governments and federal governments and whoever it is, local government, should clear all areas of salaries, all areas of pension, right? Because they're going to get almost twice what they were getting before. That's extra money. By doing that alone and paying domestic careers, right? Contractors, just pay them. That alone is a lot of relief for many households. And then make sure that what we need to be able to cope, right? Renewable energy, uh, transportation, moving food from farm to market, in the next 60 days, for example, you can start massive construction of road in rural areas uh, so that they don't waste 50% of the food that they produce. You, you empower them, you make them you know, create wealth, but you also reduce the cost of food in cities, right? Um, so those quick wins that we can do almost immediately, government has to set that in motion, for example, Review, uh, you know, border closure and whatever doesn't make sense and it's not supported by data and evidence. Just open the border for the thing to come in and regulate it with uh, import duties rather than creating unnecessary demand in the forest market. And, um, you know, government has to also even come up with a blueprint. What is it that we want to do with this money we are saving? And uh, we're not hearing enough from government apart from removing the subsidy, unifying exchange rate, there should be a blueprint that should be communicated now. And then government needs to seek, uh, I mean, federal government must, if you like, whatever you need to do, I don't even mind if you force them. Get the subnational to also make a commitment as to what they will do. For every one area you're getting an extra, you know, uh, savings from FX, subsidy remover, and, uh, you know, petrol subsidy remover, whatever it is, quantify it and tell us what you will do with this. And my recommendation is that the primary area of focus should be those interventions that will address multidimensional poverty, those areas of intervention that will help small businesses, those areas of intervention that will make it easier for businesses, whether they are large, domestic or foreign, to do businesses, preserve their existing capacity, expand on them, employ more people, and then over time, we begin to produce more so that supply side helps us to balance the pressure on, on inflation and we can then begin to bring down uh, the interest rate. All of these things are connected, but it's not rocket science. The start has been okay. Communication could have been better. This is the time to really come up with a plan uh, that can restore confidence, not only in the forest market, but in the environment generally for Nigerians not to suffer this for too long. Even though we said indicatively two to three years, I think two to three years, is more about the hard to do uh, intervention, not the immediate one. I think the immediate one should start immediately and government needs to prioritize that and stop the, you know, the introduction of policies and changes and taxes and levies that don't make sense and they are coming across as insensitive. Let me stop there in the interest of time. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for paying attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Yedili. I think uh, we can allow you undertake other assignments uh, if you have to go. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm sure we won't mind holding you on. Uh, so yes, let I me bring in... Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me bring in the registrar of uh, CIPM. There is a question waiting for you here, madam. It says, how do we prepare the employees in various parastatas ahead of staff shedding that is inevitable in companies considering high cost of running companies. I, I don't know whether I came across very clearly. Hello, Madam Twain. Yes, 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 I'm yes. here. Okay, um, says, so thank you. Yeah. Did you get the question? How do we prepare employees in various parasitals ahead of staff shedding that is in, in, inevitable in companies? 
considering high cost of running companies now? Is that that's the question? Exactly, exactly. Okay. I think um, I have to say, first and foremost, staff shedding would not apply in all cases. It wouldn't. I mean, this calls for organizations to become more strategic in various areas of their businesses. And one of that would be in terms of us, what we call a spending visibility, your expense management. Um, so dividing stuff into what we call your cost category, your business process. I'm talking from a business point of view now. Um, what are your strategies? Uh, what are your non-strategic spendings that you have in place? So a review of that actually should help prevent what we we'll refer to as the need to make people redundant, I would say. And that's what we call staff shedding. Having said that, just, just um, on the business side, in terms of actually ensuring that we're able to prepare employees, where inevitably you have to have staff shedding in place. I'm very much an advocate of empowering your employees whilst they're still in employment with yourselves on what we call developing a side hustle. When employees at the end of a nine to five or whatever hours of work they have, have something else that they're doing that does not conflict or compete with your business, they have something else they've set up for themselves, they're going to be more empowered and it takes away that what is the fear of the future in the current economic state of Nigeria or what my company is going through in terms of whether there's not enough money coming in, um, we have less customers, and therefore the business income is dwindling. Encourage your employees to actually develop something for themselves. I like what some of the universities are actually doing now. Um, and again, that's quite important because I have to say, Nigeria has been characterized by underinvestment in human capital um, through, major, two, through major areas, two major areas, education and health. Looking at the education system, a lot needs to be done more in empowering people, not just in the technical knowledge that they acquire in the university, but actually also developing other skills or what we call sometimes life skills that can help them. If you do not fall into a particular career on exiting the university or you're not able to get a job, as the university prepared you properly, able to do something else, let's be realistic. Not everyone will get a job. So some of that now tells back to what we're saying in terms of preparing our employees for the future where there's going to be staff shedding. If I have something else I've learned in the education system or even outside the education system, I'm more likely to be confident that no matter what happens, I have something I'm already developing on the side, bearing in mind it doesn't compete with my current employer. And I'm less likely to fret when I'm told, okay, um, I have to or we have to either make it redundant, there's something to fall back on. It's also in developing the employees. As, you, as, they, as they are with you, a lot of employers, I've heard them sometimes say, oh, I develop them, I run training, I send them on training, learning and development courses, and they leave. Um, or what gain is that to me? Actually, it might not be of gain to you, but when you have what we call a staff sharing, if that employee has been properly developed, they have the required skills and knowledge, expertise to take to someone else, that is not going through a staff shedding. You're more or less helping the economy as well in how you've developed those individuals. Again, when you, you also grow the economy as well as an employer, I ask you to have a side also that doesn't compete with me. As your business grows, you become an employer of labor yourself. And again, another area that we can look at is the commitment. A lot of people and a lot of employers don't see this. My employer actually encourages me to grow myself, grow a business on the side. My commitment and my loyalty to that would inevitably grow. Your employees are your greatest, they are your greatest champions. Even when they exit the organization, they're talking about you and recommending you as an employer of choice. You cannot underestimate how powerful this is. When we now talk of staff shedding, just one more point. As opposed to staff shedding, have you considered 
flexible working options. The work from home that has been covered through the various, um, the main speaker and the discussants as an option whereby you can reduce your operating expenses. We've already talked about your spending visibility. Where do you spend your money on? Where are you managing your expenses? Have we talked about part-time work? As opposed to some people would say rather than go to a zero job, no pay. Let me go part-time to save the organization money. So again, as uh, managers, as business owners, we have to be creative in order to avoid situations of staff shedding. And we have to do what we call staff shedding and making people redundant. Some of what I've presented um, should help um, alleviate um, or alleviate employees for the inevitable. Thank you. Thank you very much for those wonderful insights. Uh, I know that uh, for, for employers of labor at, I mean, at, at a time like this, the least part of resistance is always to first of all, reduce cost and staff cost is always uh, the first part of call most of the time, if not all the time. It's okay. Uh, there's another question here that I think we can throw at Dr. Okiti. He says, with the rising cost to businesses and households, can the economy withstand the multiplicity of increases in cost? Because with the attack on the disposable income of citizens, how will companies sell their products when people cannot afford to buy it? So we're dealing with the issue of affordability here. Dr. Kitty, you want to take a bite at this? Uh, with the rising cost to businesses and households, how can the economy withstand the multiplicity of increases in cost? Because with the attack on the disposable income of citizens, how will companies sell their products when people cannot afford to buy them? Dr. Kitty, please. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so very much uh, for that uh, for that question. And um, I think uh, that is what goes, I mean, that's, that question is at the heart of the problem that we have today. Uh, and uh, I would like to echo what, um, what uh, Taiwo and uh, uh, Muda said um, regarding the balancing and sequencing of these reforms. So um, just we know that three reforms have already happened. We've removed the FOI subsidy. Uh, exchange rate has been uh, aggregated into one window. And of course, we have the increase in uh, uh, diesel prices through the introduction of the uh, 7.5% on VAT. So my take on reforms, and of course, everybody knows I'm a believer in reforms. My take now is, can we have some kind of stability and see what happens in the next three to six months before we even think of any other reform? The reason is because it is not ideal for businesses to be juggling so many things at the same time. So what I mean by that is, for instance, let's say after first subsidy remover, you have a meeting. I mean, businesses would have gone back, would have gone back to the drawing board. And say, so, okay, what does this mean for the business? What does it mean in terms of cost? What does it mean in terms of revenue? What can we adjust? What can we not adjust? So that is the first step. So can you imagine the same business now coming back again in two weeks' time again to talk about exchange rates? What does it mean and what does it not mean? Then and the following week, they are talking about diesel. Then the following week, they are talking about power. So that is already a very, very, I mean, the cost dynamic is just um, uh, out of this one. So how do businesses cope? Obviously, businesses are, there are various businesses. It depends on the kind of businesses that we're talking about. Uh, my take is this, and it's generic. And the reason it's generic is because I'm not advising a business I know. I'm talking generally. Businesses must be able to dimension two things. What are the costs that they incur that will also lead to revenue? And what are the costs that they can do without because they, it has no revenue implication? So the cost that you know that if you know that the cost in this cost to your business is very critical to your revenue growth today and tomorrow, then you must keep it and you must find a way to meet that cost. But if there's a way in which we can deal with costs because they don't have implication for revenue, then that will be the first cost for us to go. It's not necessarily about sacking staff and it's not necessarily about reducing the cost of diesel. However, it will probably be a combination of some of these things, but the Number one way I look at it and the generic way of I look at it because there are 
different kinds of businesses. There are manufacturing businesses, there are knowledge businesses, the oil and gas businesses. Is what is it that we do that is focused on revenue? If it is focused on revenue, you keep that cost. If it is not focused on revenue, find a way to do without it. Thank you. Thank you very much. If it is focused on revenue, keep it. If it is not focused on, on revenue, then dispense with it. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, my sincere apologies for not uh, taking you, I mean, giving a full introduction once again. But let me just ask you to look at this issue of the social contest of policy, because I remember very clearly that you said that's one area that is very, very important. And, and, I, and I can't see anyone who will say that it's not as important as you have painted it. But can you just, again, try to do a, a small extra in about one or two minutes? What are the likely social consequences of these policies? Look at electricity, for instance. The speculation is between 100 naira and 300 naira to a unit of electricity. Um, assuming without conceding that electricity is 24 hours, seven days of the week. How many, I mean, for how long can you use one unit of electricity when you put on certain appliances? What, are, what is the implication for uh, purchasing power and several other factors. Maybe you want to take a quick look at that, sir. Because these are things that affect people on a daily basis. That's why I'm narrowing down on it. Dr. Muda, sir. Is he still on the call? Is Dr. Muda still with us? Hello? Okay. If Dr. Muda is not there, is, is Mr. Debayo still on the call, the chairman of finance committee, NECA? Is he still on the call? Okay, yeah, I'm on the call. Okay, okay uh, so, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I, actually, I actually have another question for you, sir, so I can drop that, that of Dr. Muda Yusuf. My question for you has to do with education. You painted a very, very interesting scenario. 127,000 Nigerians in UK spending about 10... Uh, million i mean uh, I, I think you gave it a figure of 10 million naira or so when you yeah, some that's just for tuition yeah yes but you yeah. it came i mean that excluding accommodation excluding food excluding upkeep allowances and things and it came to about 1.2 trillion given the precarious situation of our education how do we manage both? because like uh, this registrar of cipm said you want to give good education to your children not houses not cars not even money, but good education that can sustain them post your own lifetime. How do we manage that situation, sir? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the first thing we need to consider is uh, what is the incentive that makes people to study abroad? Now, we can look at it from two perspectives. Uh, the first perspective is the quality of the education. The second perspective is the opportunity that exists post education. Now, when you look at it, those two things are not present in Nigeria today, and which government need to focus on. Now, the quality of education uh, may not be what is required in the marketplace. And what do that mean? Because today, education has moved away from the traditional aspect that we are used to. Now, disruption, innovation, technology, artificial intelligence has more or less changed what education should be and the quality, which does not exist in Nigeria. And that is where government need to focus on. How do we more or less uh, address this narrative? The second aspect of it borders on the opportunity. Even where there's a quality, after the education, is there an uh, environment for business such that the little knowledge we have, we can use it to invent things within the economy. Likewise, are there employment opportunities also? These are the things that we need to focus on. Let us look at technology. Uh, technology has been booming over time, and Nigeria has been playing uh, more or less a critical role. Nigeria is a premium. But you can see a lot of challenges that Nigeria is a premium, most especially in FinTech, has faced in the last regime. Most especially starting from the uh, limitation from CBN uh, regulations and some other things like that. And therefore, at the end of the day, you look at it and say that, okay, uh, this environment does not necessarily favor innovation. The big players, the cabals within the economy may not favor new people coming in 
it's a law of barrier to en entry and all of things. And therefore, the question then is, where can I more or less have opportunity to excel? And that is why you find that Nigerians are moving abroad to that. Therefore, if government could address one, the quality of education and necessary the opportunities that will exist after such education, most especially entrepreneurial opportunities, okay, which will allow everyone to start a business at a small scale. When you look at most of the economies of the world, the main drivers of economy are small, medium enterprises, including micro businesses. What is there in place for them? And for example, uh, Nigeria, more or less, the, the economy of Nigeria is distributed between half of it in the formal sector, the other half in the informal sector. And that's why you find out that our GDP should have been much more close to times two of what it is because of our population, our size and all that is. But again, most of our businesses within the informal sector are outside the radar or because once they come into the radar, government establishment does not support them in terms of trying to enhance their value. Rather, they more or less create a bottleneck and bureaucracy from day one, such as coming up with taxes, coming up with issues of um, bureaucracy and some other things that limit their ways towards prosperity. Therefore, if government could address our educational qualities, which I believe this administration is trying to look into by trying to introduce tuition, but again, the aspect of it is, even if you provide me a loan, I'll only be willing to take sufficient loan to go for studies in any Nigerian university, as much as five, 10 million, provided there are opportunities for me thereafter to more or less strive in terms of my business I'm to, going to introduce as a startup or employment that's going to be. And remember that employment will be the creation of enhanced economic activities. If business are dying, according to what Taiwan said, uh, in the last two years, he has more or less one of businesses more than his entire career that has spent close to about two decades. The question then is what opportunity exists for the young youths? And if government could address that with private uh, public partnership, I believe we can get there. And that's just my view. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I think by now we should be rounding up. I don't know if there is any perspective that anyone wants to share within 30 seconds, I mean, uh, 30 seconds to one minute, uh, just very quickly, uh, we've exceeded our time with about 19 minutes. But I think it's a, it's, it's a, a time well spent. So if there's any perspective anyone wants to share as a closing thought before I ask the DG to come back and say a word of thank you to everyone that has been... Uh, uh, that has participated in this program. It, just in your likely event that you want the slides to be sent to you, you, you may wish to drop your email address in the chat box so that the back end can collate and make the, the presentations available to us. Uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, it's been a very wonderful time. Is there any thoughts that anyone wants to share? 30 seconds, one minute as a closing remark. Okay. okay. Uh let me start. I think I'll switch. I'll speak to the fact that uh, we need to more or less government need to tailor uh, our master hierarchy of needs. Okay, we have about five levels, and I believe our government need to focus much more on the first two levels because we are a developing nation and we are a poor country by the indices of the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics with respect to multidimensional poverty where we have some kind of number of Nigerians, over 1.3 million of us in uh, multidimensional poverty. And therefore we need to focus, government needs to focus much more on psych as physiological needs, which means Nigerians need food, Nigerians are hungry. We need shelter, we don't have accommodation. Nigerians need water, quality water. We need to bridge according to the president, let the poor brains. We need security, which is financial security, health awareness, safety, and others. If we're able to address that, government can now move towards social needs, esteem needs, and probably per venture will get there as soon as possible, self-actualization needs. And that is my view for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Okiti, you want to give us a parting shot? 
Yes, uh, thank you so very much for moderating uh, this session. Um, what I just want to say is to emphasize uh, the point I made earlier. So reforms are very, very tough, but they are needed. Reforms are tough, but they are needed. So we understand that the reforms are needed and we understand that we have to go through these reforms. However, the results of reforms are never, never immediate. So no one should expect to see the results of the current ongoing reforms in the next two, three months. But what is important is this. And that is what I said before. Government is not communicating. We need to communicate. So what does communication do? Communication gives an idea. I mean, it allows the government to say, look, this is why we are doing this. This is what we think will happen. And when this happens, then you can get the reward of the sacrifices that you are making now. That's number one. Number two, communication will help the government get some very, very critical feedback. Feedback to the policies that they have, especially in the area of balancing and sequencing of the reforms. That's number two. And of course, communication will give hope to Nigerians. Nigerians need hope at the moment. It's like me telling my children, oh, look, uh, we can't have dinner today because we need breakfast tomorrow. But I can't just, it can't just be 7 p.m. and they are expecting dinner and I just don't say anything. Eh? Or they are expecting uh, some sumptuous dinner and I don't even give them something little to have. So we need constant communication from the government. But I believe that this is being held back by the appointment of ministers. So they need to also speed that up so that we can have some communications on the plan that is uh, on the plan going forward. And I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hope, hope, hope. Of course, their, 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 their mantra was renewed hope. So let's see how far the hope can be renewed. Thank you very much. Um, this registrar CIPM, Madam Tony, you want to give us a parting shot? Uh, I, I know Dr. Muda may have left because I've not heard his voice. His voice. Uh, the registrar CIPM in one or two, in, in one minute, if she's still on the call. Yes, I am. I am. Quickly, thank you very quickly. Yes. Um. Thank you very much. I think my um parting words will be in terms of um managing what we call the social economic. Um, consequences. And just very quickly in two, three parts, businesses, households, and the nation. Um, in terms of businesses, again, organizations now need to start remodeling their businesses to suit current realities. We've had that um, conversation in the last couple of hours. Um, on, term, on the terms of the employees, I mean, let's look at organizations, businesses, looking at their employee welfare policies. Somebody, one of the speakers discussions mentioned this in terms of welfare, the welfare of the employee, the welfare of the citizen is very critical. Um, again, look, let's look at implementing cost of optimization initiatives. Um, so again, that's surrounding all the diesel stuff, all that daily operating expenses, which we've all alluded to in the course of this discussion. Um, in terms of households, let's be realistic. As individuals, as business owners, as citizens of this nation, we have to look at reducing expectations. I think sometimes the disappointment stems from expecting so much um, and getting very little from those expectations, which causes um, disappointment. So let's, as individuals, um, reduce expectations. We need to begin to focus on what we call needs, not wants. Let's focus on needs, not wants, and financial prudence. Let's be prudent as citizens of this nation. We are going through a tough time. Um, that's the reality. But are we financially prudent in how we spend and how we uh, manage our resources? And in terms of the nation, now talking to the nation, to the government, let's look at, again, we mentioned it, diversifying our economy, reduction of taxes. I think that's been a very major part of this conversation today. And then opening up our borders um, for business and fluidity. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, there are so many questions to ask, but we can't keep people here. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to bring in the DG to please step forward and then say a word of thank you 
uh, to everyone that has participated from the chairman of the NECA Committee on Finance to Dr. Kitty uh, to Dr. Uh, Mr. Yedele, who is an associate professor at the Babcock University, uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, who has left, and then uh, everyone who has been in attendance. Uh, DG, sir, please step forward. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Fadipe. I think I'm, without saying much, without saying very much, I think I'll say more than, more than thank you. Because our, our position is this, or this is our own, our view in the context of everything that has been said. First, while we also commend the government for the bold step it has taken, the bold step of um, coming up to remove the first subsidy, you know, what many governments have not been able to do over a long period of time. Um, we have canvassed for the removal for more than 10 years and um, coming to remove it was, was a bold move. And the, 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 the statistics that we have seen over time, in the context of the quantum of work that we use now, they have reduced considerably, and the amount that we are supposedly saving as a nation from the removal says a lot to the, 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 the cry, the clarion call for the removal of forest subsidy. Now, we also wish that the government should not take, should not overstretch its goodwill by now burdening organized businesses or burdening Nigerians with so many things at, this, at, the, at the same time. Government in its wisdom dragged us to this, to this, to this point where we are in. The massive debt that we have, the, the unsustainable foil subsidy, so many issues that we face that are as a result of policies of government, directly or indirectly. And it would be harsh for businesses and individuals to be made to bear the brunt of the reforms. As Dr. Muda said, while those reforms are welcome reforms, but they should be implemented in such a way that they don't kill those that we are trying to save. It is very important because the policies are not, they are not ends on their own. They are means to an end. And we should not destroy those that we are trying to save by this, this, by this, this onslaught. You know, that's what we call it with the last government. When the last government was going, they gave us a parting gift of increased taxes, increased excise duties, even the introduction of new ones. And we have other bills at the National Assembly still waiting at the Night Assembly that has components of other taxes. Now. How can a business survive when it's currently paying over 60 different taxes, levies, and fees across the three tiers of government? But I know it's, it's, it's not done. We cannot tax ourselves to prosperity. The path that we should follow and we have, we have, we have presented our paper to government is the path of first, let's create an environment that is conducive for organized businesses to thrive. Sustainable enterprises, even at the ILO, you know, sustainable enterprises is the foundation for anything. You, know, you want to talk about employee welfare, it is sustainable enterprise. You want to talk about national growth because it is, GDP doesn't just, it's not a concept that is exclusive of how businesses are doing. It is the basis for GDP is how well your businesses are doing. It is an outcome of it. So why not focus or create an environment for that, those businesses to grow, to remain sustainable. If businesses are sustainable, then we solve the issue of revenue in the short, medium, and the long term. So barraging mm -hmm. Nigerians with the issue of tax, it's we think is not, it's not the, the right, the right step to be taken. We think and we canvass to the government that the last fiscal monetary monetary measures that was signed by the by the past last administration that came in before the the, the that, that was signed before they left, that they should suspend that policy. You know, the increase in excise duty, we should suspend it because they are contradictions in the system. If organized businesses are not surviving, and you mentioned the issue of Japa, now we have corporate Japaism now, where organized businesses, most are even relocating to our neighboring countries because those environments, they've been made conducive for businesses to thrive. 
then we compound the challenges and the problems that we have. Without reiterating the palliative that I've mentioned, we have said, so we have sent our paper document to government, a palliative that they should give in the, in the short term, palliative they should give in the medium term, palliatives for the long term. These things are not rocket science. There are things that can be implemented within three months, short, three to six months short term, six to 12 months and medium term. And then we look at the long term option of, of, of bringing those refineries back to life and also privatizing them. Because government have not shown credibility in managing any business in this country. Look at what we had with, um, with NITEL, look at what we have with NIPOS, look at what we have with railway, the recent railway that we had. That is also the incurring massive debt. So we have set our, our position to government, and the submission of our view is this: let's create an environment that will make productivity to continue, that will make productivity to be attractive, not only to local investors, but also to foreign investors. It is less of us going to going to foreign countries. Uh, doing jingles and telling investors that look, they can come to the country and invest. If I'm a foreign investor and I have ten billion dollars to bring to Nigeria, I would probably not go to the Federal Ministry of Industry and Investment. I will not go to the Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment. I will go first or call my colleagues, other expatriates that are running businesses in Nigeria, and I will ask them, "How is it? How is doing business in Nigeria?" Their testimony, their comments will influence whether we bring such funds to Nigeria or not. So we are calling on government. The hike in 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 electricity tariff we think is ill timed. The introduction of uh, VAT on on diesel we also think it is ill timed. You, you don't really destroy the businesses that you are trying to save, and you don't further impoverish. Nigerians or household that you are trying to you are trying to protect. That is our position. I will continue to engage government on these positions on behalf of organized businesses and then on behalf of 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 of, um, of, of all other our uh, constituents. So once again, I want to thank you, Mr. Fadiko first for for um, for allowing to moderate the session for us. Uh, Mr. Taiwo, thank you very much for always an happy belated. Is it belated birthday they call it now? Happy belated <laughs> birthday, sir. Dr. Kitty, thank you for always. We'll still be reaching out to you. Uh, Dr. Muda has also been, um, been very consistent, like not a star with us. Thank you very much, sir. We'll also be reaching out to you in furtherance of our advocacy. CEO, thank you, ma. Thank you for, for making our time from your very, very busy schedule. And our own Mr. Um, Muiwa Adibayo, thank you for thank you for always. The after this session, we all go back to the trenches. <laughs> and continue our advocacy for enterprise sustainability. Thank you once again, our participants, those that have joined us from 11 up to this moment. And last but not the least, thank you to uh, my colleagues in the Secretariat for also making this, making this happen. Thank you very much and look forward to our next programs. By next month, in view of the so many issues that we have, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be landing in Abuja for the second edition of the Employer Summit, the National Employer Summit. And the focus of the summit this year is trade, trade and non-oil exports. While we are, we, are, we are struggling with issue of Forex now, after the, the crashing of both and boats of both um, boat markets, and there's actual shortage of Forex now. I think what we should refocus on is trade and how do we maximize trade and non-oil exports to generate Forex to create employment and to extend the trajectory of our growth as a nation. So join us on the 10th and 11th of July at um, in Abuja for the second National mm -hmm. Employment Summit. The theme is trade and non-oil exports, changing the narratives for national development. For further information, please send your send a, a message to the to the chat platform and my colleagues will pick the message and get across to you. I also want to request on behalf of my colleagues, please, for those that are still on the call, please kindly drop your name, your, your organization, and then your phone number so that we can reach you per adventure. We want to send you more information on our subsequent programs. Your name, 
your organization, phone number, and email. Thank you once again, and God bless you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Have a great uh, time out there. Uh, you may want to consider Mama Put rather than go to Chinese restaurant in view of the economic situation. <laughs>